You can be a part of bringing the dreams of families to life when you consider egg donation with Fairfax Egg Bank. It's easier than you think. Fill out an application online, meet for screening appointments, and begin. Because your efforts are so important, you'll be compensated up to $60,000. So if you're a female between the ages of 19 and 30 and are a healthy non-smoker, contact Fairfax Egg Bank today. FairfaxEggBank.com. You could be compensated up to $60,000 for your time and effort in helping a family grow. Fairfax FairfaxEggBank.com. They say it takes a village, but raising a family might not be for you right now or ever. And that's just fine because you can still be a part of bringing the dreams of families to life when you consider egg donation with Fairfax Egg Bank. It's easier than you think. Fill out an application online, meet for screening appointments, and begin. The retrieval process is quick and painless and only takes about 20 minutes. Because your efforts are so important, you'll be compensated up to $60,000. This isn't a decision to take lightly, but the ability to give the gift to family and be compensated to follow your own dreams? That's a village working together. So if you're a female between the ages of 19 and 30 and are a healthy non-smoker, contact Fairfax Egg Bank today, fairfaxeggbank.com, and begin the easy process of donation. Remember, you could be compensated up to $60,000 for your time and effort in helping a family grow. Use it towards the future you want for yourself. Find out more at fairfaxeggbank.com. Spending some time reconnecting with nature this summer? Here's a camping hack from L.L. Bean to make your next trip the best yet. When putting together your gear, wrap a piece of duct tape around your water bottle. It's barely noticeable, but if another piece of gear breaks or tears... Pull off your tape to make a quick patch or repair. For more camping hacks, visit youtube.com slash LL Bean. LL Bean. Be an outsider. Write that. Write that down for me, Saito. Write that down for me, Saito. Welcome back to Write That Down. I'm one of your hosts, Justin Nipper. I edit for FightGameMedia.com. I'm a staff writer at F4WOnline.com and WrestlingObserver.com. I'm back with Japan's leading pro wrestling author, historian, broadcast journalist, my co-host, Mr. Fumi Saito. All right, so for this episode, we're kicking off our latest deep dive showcase series. We are going to focus on the history of Joshi pro wrestling or women's pro wrestling in Japan. Um, There are lots of blind spots throughout women's wrestling's history in Japan, so... um, while it is more difficult to account in general than men's wrestling, we did our best to fill in the blanks and provide the broad strokes. Um, we generally cover from around 1948 into like late 60, 67 in the early 70s today, and we spent a lot of time talking about Mahafumiake, we talked about Beauty Pair, Maki Ueda, Jackie Sato, and we spoke a lot about Mildred Burke, uh, among others, today, so... Lots more than that. Enjoy it. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Fight Game Media Network, the podcast feed, the free feed on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you usually listen to your podcast. It does always help us out. Helps out a ton. All right. That's it. Let's get into Joshi Pro Wrestling History, Part 1. Doki's and four episodes of Giant Baba, and I think we are not going to avoid women's wrestling, you know, because... Just because it's so hard, um, this history, uh, more like a, a official history of women's professional wrestling, trace back to like 1945. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry that the Kiki is walking around top of my table. Right? Oh, yeah, hello <laughs> Kiki. She did a run in. Yeah, yeah. He, he. Excuse me. He, he. Excuse yeah, me. he's a boy. Yeah, big boy. That women's the first thing in you know, American audience. American fans you know, who want to learn history and study history of Joshi Pro Wrestling. Japanese women's professional wrestling, pro wrestling, was never part of men's show. That's the basic difference. Mm-hmm. See, you and I talk, you know, talk about, uh, well, we have to touch upon Mildred Park mm. and Fabulous Mula and her school of wrestling and the uh, wrestlers you know, she produced and all that. And uh, They've always been part of the men's show. Just one right. match in between some sand, sand, sandwich between men's card. And uh, during the war, a lot of, you know, a part of the audience too, but the wrestlers were away in, uh, during the war in Europe or somewhere. 
And that's why Meldred Park in, during 1940s headlined Big Wrestling Card in America uh, as a big star and because there was a war, you know. But yes, postal, is, this is wrestling, but we still have to learn some, you know, things about real world. And, and there was a war, right? And uh, yeah, the World War II. And there was, you know, 1941, there was a Pearl Harbor. 1945, there was Hiroshima and Narasaki, and the war was over. And there's a thing called GHQ, General Headquarter, U.S. Occupation of Japanese Land, you know, GHQ, General Headquarter, um, uh, that uh, led by General MacArthur. And what are we talking about? In 1951, there was a, a tribute to troops, right? Very beginning of Ricky Dozan era pro wrestling in 1951. That, that that I mean, so 1949. And I'm sorry, yeah, that Bobby Bruns and and his crew and his you know his you know that the tour crew came to Japan and ran the the wrestling tour for the troops and a little bit for Japanese audience. Okay, mm -hmm. like a USO tour. Pretty much, because it's ac under U.S. occupation still, and the troops were still in Japan, and then and Bobby Brown's and his his wrestling crew, that the whole tour thing came to Japan for the tribute for the troops in Japan. They had Japanese audience in the building, and it's it, that the building was Memorial Hall, which was old Sumo Palace actually. And they changed the name during the U.S. occupation. And it was 1951 that, that the war was over 1945. Six years later, the U.S. occupation remained that the general head, headquarters that, that was still in Japan. And Bobby Browns and his crew and came in and had a wrestling tour for the tribute for the troops. And Ricky Dozen joined and debuted and therefore the birth of pro wrestling in Japan, right? Mm -hmm. They kind of imported it to Japan. Yeah, and then also this the domestic superstar and the promoter to be in Ricky Dawson. Mm. Yeah, that's the yeah in in the more revised, motivated uh, that uh, modified history of you know pro pro wrestling in Japan. They want want to you know have story like Ricky Dawson started all you know, right? And, Rick, yeah, that's also partially true because Ricky Dozan was a promoter, Ricky Dozan was a superstar, and uh, Ricky Dozan pretty much did it all, but uh, he couldn't have had network television f right from the get-go, right? And the Mitsubishi big sponsorship, a big, you know, budget behind it, and all these times, it, it's like a post-war period, and there's no such thing as a working visa for Americans to come in, right? Sure. All these things had to be created. And yeah, Ricky Dozan was responsible to make television huge. And also he made, yeah, if there was no wrestling, television wouldn't have been as, as a popular right away. And if, if there wasn't television, Ricky Dozan wouldn't be as, just as popular. So they helped each other. That's the birth of pro wrestling in Japan. That another big piece of history that's been so overlooked, same 1951. The women's professional wrestling, the seeds was planted. Mildred Park, the okay November of 1951 to be exact. The the the, the, the tour group of Mildred Park, Mildred Park and May Young, yes, the same May Young, great May Young, mm -hmm. <laughs> who worked all the way till 1999 or 2000 for that worked matter. until yeah. the Attitude Era. I think so. That same same May Young, yeah. Mildred Park as promoter and champion, and May Young, Rita Martinez, Ruth Bolt Kelly, Gloria Bartini, uh, right, the, the six women's wrestler, uh, Beverly Anderson, yeah. So six women's wrestler came over and they toured Japan, just like the Sharp, Sharp Brothers did. But that part of history was pretty much forgotten. Not forgotten, we know about it, but it wasn't as publicized as the one reason was that Rick Dozen kind of resented women's wrestling as a whole, and he that that is why J, Rick Dozen and JWA company never used women's wrestler. Okay, 
Hang on, hang on, okay? Okay? Mm-hmm. All right, so. Yeah, so in 1950s, the part of the history, it's been so overlooked that the women's wrestling in Japan, the, the, the big seed were planted the same year, 1951. Mildred Bart and her crew came in and they did the, the tour for, for the U.S. troops. And that's when Mildred Bark discovered quite a few women's wrestlers in Japan and trained here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Therefore, the beginning of women's wrestling, officially 1951. But rewind the tape a little, a little bit. There's a, a domestic women's wrestling as early as 1948. The vaudevillians in Japan, the Ikari brothers and, and her, you know, the Ikari brothers, the vaudevillians, and their two sisters started wrestling profession, you know, the, the running shows around the country, just like women's res- professional wrestling in America. And uh, the, the mentality was more of a barnstorming. Is that the words right? Correct? You know, like the it barnstorming. Was definitely, it was definitely that kind of, it was more of an attraction than as a, a competitive match. It was still. Or a sport, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A sport, but, but kind but, of like a, a novelty sport. Not your yeah, not show, your typical showbiz, yeah. showbiz sport, yeah. Showbiz. Well, if you want to go back to the root of something like women's wrestling in Japan, you can go back to 1600 and 1700s, the women's sumo wrestling, seriously. Oh, my God. That existed, what, the 300 years period, you know, that uh, was just like... You know, sumo wrestling and professional wrestling in in, in 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 the West very similar. You know, a lot of times it's a star, you know, driven sport or entertainment, and people have questioned that the legitimacy of it if it's real competitive sport or the being entertainment. And the sumo always had that, you know, the nature in it because they wrestle in front of people and in, in, in audience. And people choose good guy and bad guys, and they want good guy to win, or it's more like a realm of cultural anthropology, if you think about it, you know. And also, very limited resource of information because the, the record cannot be found mm. because they didn't cover it as a sport, you know. And so, but uh, yeah, to make a long story, story short here, that uh, there was such thing as women's sumo wrestling. Mm-hmm. In about 300 year period, it was very similar to women's wrestling, and some people look at women's as women's women's sumo in Japan as the root of Joshi pro wrestling. Mm. That's what I'm talking. I see. Yeah, right. yeah, because you know, because you are going in in front of audience and the sumo ring above the ground a little bit, much like wrestling ring, and people around it. They call it ring, although it's round. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, this is like a square. But the the thing is, you can watch both wrestling, pro wrestling, pro wrestling and sumo wrestling from a 360 degree angle from anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Actually, it's very and above the ground, so people can watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very the the. the the whole stylization of building up, you know, the creation of in, entertainment form is always, always been very similar, you know, Western pro wrestling and Japanese sumo wrestling. Really, as a cultural anthropology, it's very, very similar. Anyhow, uh, so the, the, the root was there. In Europe, there is like, you know, before George Hack and Schmidt and all this, there have been wrestling or something similar to that. You know, we've been doing that since, I don't know, Greek period, right? I mean, everywhere, every country has its own kind of wrestling history. And yeah, very different. big men or big women, I mean, almost naked, go out there, go up there and then fight, huh? They would go and fight for the the woman's, for to marry someone, to marry a woman of the village. They were doing or, or it just to... just the entertainment purpose. For entertainment. People, yeah, because these people are normally bigger than regular guy, people, right? Yeah, in some countries like Nigeria or Mongolia, they would do wrestling 
in the off season of crop, like off crop season. So when it was sure. when it was a certain weather, it would be and because and this is also interesting. It especially around the world, wrestling and in Japan, wrestling and non wrestling events, traditional or ritual events are associated with sumo. A lot of yeah, after rice farm got a hold of harvest, yeah. Sure, sure. There's that, and there's also the the. There's a lot of different parts to a full sumo show and a full Joshi Pro Wrestling show. In that, there's not just the fight in the ring. There's yeah. a lot that happens in, before in Asia or the part of Asia or the Iran or the India, Pakistan, all the way to like China, the Korea to Japan. All these that the wrestlers or I, including sumo wrestlers, right? Or the fighters, it's or the gladiators. They were owned by the, uh, the this is like a stable of wrestlers who were owned by land, you know, landlords. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like uh, it's this. This is there were a formation of the, like a very beginning of professional wrestling, like things in every culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Yeah. It, well, I think it also it it speaks to what people wanted for entertainment, and in Japan, Joshi Pro Wrestling ended up we we call it you know women's pro wrestling, but there's a little bit extra to it compared to any other types of pro wrestling. There's a lot of showbiz to it. Yeah, yeah, and also yeah, the, so that that's why I touched upon women's sumo wrestling culture it goes back to 1600 and 1700s. And now that the fast forward the tape a little bit, only three years after the war, 1948, there was women's wrestling in Japan before Ricky Dawson. Interesting, huh? Mm. Yeah. And in 1955, I mean, 1951, the same year Ricky Dawson debuted as a professional wrestler under Bobby Browns and, and 1954, you already have TV and you have Sharp Brothers, Ricky Dawson, Masahiko Kimura, the big television extravaganza and television made wrestling famous and wrestling made television famous right? like, a, like a gorgeous Joji era and those are all men's wrestling mm -hmm. and women's wrestling same year 1955 and 51 Mildred Bark came to Japan and planted the seed of American style professional wrestling and five wrestlers Japanese women wrestler debuted and by 1955 they were like uh, it's like just like you know history repeating itself in not just one company but by 1955 there was all japan women's wrestling not the version of all japan pro wrestling that we know of like from 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s but the all japan pro wrestling association and tokyo universal joshi pro wrestling done all japan pro wrestling club <laughs> mm -hmm. and tokyo joshi pro wrestling not the tokyo joshi that you know right i mean today but it's a different i mean it's 70 year old i mean i mean uh, 70 years ago there was another tokyo joshi pro wrestling and hiroshima joshi pro wrestling is like a seven women's wrestling company around the, uh, around japan i mean around the island by 1955 all american style professional wrestling very interesting huh see this that the all Japan pro wrestling that you know Bon Nakano, the Manami Tota, the Ajakang, the Kyoko, you know, the, the, the glorified this is like big, huge all Japan women's pro wrestling AJWW that wouldn't start until 1968. Hmm. There was a time in, in mid 50s to all through 60s, there were women's company running shows around country in Japan and popular but these were the, the groups that the, they were, weren't covered by sports pages or even wrestling magazine didn't even cover all that much the, there was quite a few reasons for it that the, during rick dozen's era the rick dozen pretty much resented the women's wrestling uh as a whole and <clears throat> basically that, that's why that the rick dozen's jwa never had women's match at their shows and that's that's still the tradition until today. I mean, in general, yeah, can New Japan, New Japan, or all Japan never have women's wrestlers in the, in their ring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost race. I mean, like almost sexist thing or male chauvinistic thing. That I'm not so proud of it, but uh, 
but the tradition remains, you know, set the subjects aside, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's just, I think, most Japanese fans compartmentalize, there's women's wrestling here, there's men's wrestling over here, sometimes they overlap, but in general, they're, they're totally different, whereas I think now, especially now, women's wrestling, men's wrestling, it's very, very mixed here. You'll see now, yeah. most now, programs yeah. have one or two or more women's matches, tag team matches. It's more competitive, but it's it's not too... And there are stars, female stars. Oh, definitely. But I, I yeah, think yeah. The, one of the big differences, we'll get into it later and probably into other episodes too, is the style in the ring. It looks, it's just, it's like what the men do. Not not trying to reduce it to like, it's just, that's all it is. But in general, the style is pretty similar to what men would do in the ring today. If you watch those old 1950s, 1960s matches with women, with Mildred Because Park, they were coached different by a different wrestling. group of people. Yeah, yeah. now that the, what the WWE Performance Center or the independent you know, wrestling companies or wrestling schools around the country in, in the States, yeah, they, the men and women were trained together in the ring. Therefore, the styles are the same, one and the same. And working left-hand side, you know, work left, turn right. And just the form is the same, you know, the men's wrestling and the women's wrestling. Whereas Japanese wrestling, Joshi Pro Wrestling, we should call it, Japanese wrestling, Joshi Pro Wrestling, women's wrestling had its own evolution and, and a different development in history that a lot of women's wrestlers or wrestling companies in Japan who had, had this initially Mildred Park. And in late 60s, fabulous Mura school of wrestling. But a lot of, the, of this women's company in Japan had Mexican lucha influence. Therefore, mm -hmm. you know, you work right. You know, mm -hmm. that, uh, in, you know, instead of having left hand and you know, left arm first, but the right, you know, when you do the, I'm, I'm talking about the lockup and, you know, color and the elbow tie up. But at the beginning of the match, you have right arm forward. And just like Mexican style, that happens in women's wrestling. Even to this day, that uh, oh, people like, you know, that the Meiko Satomura, she can work both because initially she learned the right arm first in a Mexican style, then adapted to a left first. That's mm. why she are able to do both hands, you know, both style. But in all Japan, you know, all Japan style, all the way till 90s, including people like Aja Khan, it's Mexican right hand style. Mm. NFL Sunday Ticket is now on YouTube and YouTube TV, which means that it just got easier to be an NFL fan, even if you live far away. Like, maybe you like the Bears, but you're hibernating in Panthers territory. But with NFL Sunday Ticket, your out-of-market team is never more than a short distance away, specifically the distance from you to your remote control. NFL Sunday Ticket, now on YouTube and YouTube TV. Go to youtube.com slash presale to get $50 off. Terms and embargoes apply. Offer ends 919. No refund. Subscription auto renews. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui, and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else, like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. We'll have right to talk arm. about that more when we get, when Mexico. The more modern. Yeah. yeah. Well, also just when and Mexican companies and Japanese companies, when women's wrestling started to work together and start business relationships. Yeah, but the, we don't know how Lucha Libre became right hand work, work right style. There's a, quite a few different theories to it you know mexican wrestler who learned style in in in, in america brought that back and and made, made mistakes to making everything right hand instead of left that's another thing and it just quite a few different theories as to why lucha libre work on right and we don't we still don't have the answer to this day you know but uh that's the fact is though when Japanese women's pro wrestling had so much lucha influence early on that the right hand side in the work style is still there. I mean, still here in Japan. That's what I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the people like Jaguar Yokota, or even Bon Nakano, they, you know, when you lock up, you have your right arm forward 
a lot of times in Japan. But mm -hmm. now it's you know universal uh, uh, that the uh, style that the uh, stardom wrestlers always left you know that uh, you, you know like worldwide style and uh, there's a differences in style if you look at it in, in details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it evolved in a different way. I mean, you, you can watch men's wrestling. You can see a lot of. It's not too it doesn't deviate from what it originally was. It, it does, but doesn't do that too much. It, and it's, right, it, right. It women's wrestling. There were a lot of different influences. The, a lot of the wrestlers would define what the style was like at the time. Yeah, yeah, but the, I I don't want to bore all the listeners out about the big details of this. You know, <laughs> Japanese joshi pro wrestling in 1950s. Well, but the the plan. I mean, the seeds were planted way back in 1951 by Mildred Bark. And that portion of history has been all so overlooked. So that the uh, women's wrestling in Japan is just as old or even older than Ricky Dozen's pro wrestling. For the, you know, it's interesting. And she's the and, one who brought over yeah. the WWA, WWWA title. That is a little bit later on. Like you have to fast forward n another fifteen years because it will be. It won't be until like sixty-seven. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. So and, it's a little bit later. Yeah, the, the post-war, only six years after the war was over, and it's still GHQ General Headquarter. You know, occupation in Japan that the that the tribute to troops wrestling show from America was was produced in Japan, and there were. You know Bobby Brown's men's wrestling tour that discovered Ricky Dozan, and also 1951 same year, the Mildred Bark uh, had a tour women's wrestling all around the country, very popular and just as popular I think, and like a new entertainment from America, and it was going to be popular, but JWA and Ricky Dozan didn't really take up on women's wrestling as as a part of the JWA thing, and therefore women's wrestling had a completely different history and completely different development, completely different evolution. Women's wrestling grew as women's wrestling in Japan. That's what I'm trying to get to. Hmm. Yeah. But that, by having that completely separate history, that the, we always had many wrestlers, women's wrestlers, not just two wrestlers among men's card. You know, there always been women's company, you know, women's wrestling company around right. the country. It had its own, it had its own group. It wasn't just one or two matches on the men's show. It was uh, right, right. It was never like that. Yeah, it had room to develop. It had room yeah, to, yeah. Uh, yeah, And also had an amateur wrestling influence too. That the most of the wrestlers were trained both professional wrestling and amateur wrestling, freestyle wrestling. I mean, at the same at the dojo, that the practice session was the same. It was much more serious than the American style at the time. But it was going to be professional wrestling, and it was going to be entertainment, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. In a different way, yeah, that's right. In a different way. In as, as early as 1955, women's wrestling in Japan had television. Yeah, their own television. In Japan? Yeah, yeah. Which channel was that on? It was not a regular weekly program, like a one-hour show every week, but when they had their title matches you know that the uh, women's wrestling in japan had a little bit different setup like uh, they had got the flyweights or bantam weights uh, the featherweight and lightweights and uh, you know then the heaviest one was a middleweight you know what i'm saying much like boxing huh and that's what that the wrestling becomes in japanese wrestling become a little bit deceiving because they treated this similar to boxing therefore people watched it as a sport Right, I think that seemed to be the just kind of how things were but around the forties and fifties. Boxing and wrestling were probably as linked as they ever. Yeah, would as be. Much, yeah, like a Joe Louis Sailor era. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, you you know the the Ring magazine. There was also the Ring wrestling. Oh version. yeah, o over here too. The boxing magazine and wrestling magazine were were the one and the same at the beginning. The the idea it came it came from that sort of. The the sports aren't the same, but the businesses are similar. And ring looked similar. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, and had a ring announcer and referee. They dressed the same, you know. The similar approaches, you know, and a, a lot of boxing fans were wrestling fans and vice versa until, I mean, things developed in different ways over right. here and over in Japan too. 
Right. And there was um, um, also the company against company thing even ha- happening even in, in the late 60s, even within women's wrestling, there were like a comp- five, six different company. It was unified into Nippon Joshi Pro Wrestling Association once in six, 1967. All the company joined to become like big one big company, Nippon Joshi Pro Wrestling, Japan Pro, Joshi Pro Wrestling Association, right? And 1968, they they invited Fabulous Muller to be, uh, to, you know, to, you know, basically world champion to be brought in and leave the belt there. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of like Luthes. Sure. I don't know how many times Luthes won the, not just NWA World Heavyweight title, but the, almost every part of part of the state, you know, com, you know, country that the where the wrestling was. When Luthes was brought in, he was already World Heavyweight Champion, and probably lose to your local superstar. Therefore, you can create your local World Heavyweight Championship belt, not that that in in that town. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah, because so, the the champion isn't from the area. He goes on his way. The local wrestler stays. They got their own belt. The territory has its own belt now. It's an therefore, organic transition. Therefore, you have transition. many many world heavyweight champion in wrestling. That's sure. like a, just like men's. Yeah, it happened in women's wrestling in Japan in 1968 too. Fabulous Mula came and left. Right. And there was Japanese stars at the time, you, you know, like uh, Yuki Kotomoe, the, you know, all, all this is like uh, the people way before Maha Fumiake or Beauty Pair. I mean, ooh, I mean, decades before Crash Girls and Bonacano. You know what I'm saying? But uh, in 1968, this Nippon Joshi Pro Wrestling Association had a big split. Japan Joshi Pro Wrestling and All Japan Pro Wrestling. That became uh, that the uh, All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling that we all know of. That's the beginning of it. 1968. Matsunaga Brothers. Yeah. So who were the Matsunaga Brothers? Matsunaga Brothers are four brothers. Actually, uh, they, they were five brothers, but the one brother, you know, never got involved. So all four of them, the real brothers. They were like a post-war into 50s to early 60s. They were in conjunction with women's wrestling. They were they were boxers and and a judoka, and they actually worked what looks like MM today's MMA, but work you know judo against boxing, wrestler against boxer, or judoka against wrestler or something like that. They were doing it among brothers. Mm. They're working, yeah, and also running company. And also, they are building rings. They are also running concessions. They are sitting at the tab- tables and rings and all these things. And they and they pack up and go to another town. Barnstorming. That the root of women's wrestler. The Matsunaga brothers were promoters, and I guess a lot of wrestlers and and, and their relatives and cousins are all married to each other or something. And they, you know what I'm saying? Mm. That uh, it's kind of like your. Uh, What's the famous family in Tennessee? You know that uh, the Welch and, and uh, no, well, well before Jared, uh, the Welches and followers. Yeah, Ur, uh, Herb Welch and in 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 yeah yeah, and that all the you know Welch and the follow like a body follower sons and their cousins and all the referee and and and, and the daughters all married to wrestlers and all this. You cannot count them all, but. The, there was such family as the Welch family in, in Tennessee. They ran wrestling through 1920s to 30s and 40s. Much like that in Japan, Matsunaga brothers ruled the women part of professional wrestling industry for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to make a long story short. And therefore, in 1968, that all Japan women's pro wrestling finally were, was born. And Japan... Women's Pro Wrestling had uh, had Channel Twelve, not regular show, but whenever the champion comes in, have a t- title match, like you know, they air that as a TV special. And all Japan's Women's Pro Wrestling had Channel Eight, Fuji Television. Mm-hmm. So two channels, network channels that didn't carry men's wrestling at the time, wanted to have women's wrestling on uh, on the channels. That helped. 
now it was good that we skipped, you know, all the way from 1950s and 1960s, and now it's late 1960s into yeah. early 70s. It's so, really amazing, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's that's how, I mean, that's just how it developed. I mean, like you said, Yuki Dozan, who was the boss for a good chunk of that time, wasn't interested in having women's oh, wrestling on the shows. Even or... during the Ricky Dozan's era, there was like a five, six other wrestling companies in Japan that the Ricky Dozan had to conquer mm. and be made into one. Yeah. You know, there was one in Osaka, there was one in Kim Kumamoto, that the, the one that the Masahiko Kimura was running, and there were quite a few men's wrestling companies besides JWA. Ricky Dozan conquered, you know, one by one and made it into big, huge JWA. And something similar that, you know, in the women's wrestling industry happened, but it, the, the women's wrestling were never covered as a news, as like in, in the Tokyo sports, in the news, you know, like a, your tabloid newsstand newspapers, they didn't really put result of women's matches for longest time. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the details of these, you know, records and, 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 and the title, title match or the who are the champions is all kind of sketchy, uh, you know, to this day. It was Rashi Ogawa, you know, in nineteen seven, in the late nineteen seventy, actually nineteen seventy eight to be exact, when Rashi, twenty one year old Rashi Ogawa, started working for All Japan Pro, you know, women's pro wrestling. He went all the way back and tried to have as accurate as possible record of who was the champion and what day in town, you know, that the title match happened and then in the championship change and all these things in Ross 21 year old Rossi Ogawa did all the research did you know that I didn't know he was that deeply connected <laughs> to the lineage of women's wrestling he is one of the last uh, he started oh god right now now that the 65 year old Rossi is a king of Joshi pro wrestling in Japan after all but uh 21 year old you know Rossi young Rossi Ogawa started working for all Japan women's wrestling as early as 1978 he was only 21. interesting huh mm. but uh he, 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 we'll get to rossi in a little bit but the women's wrestling you know start having actual written history around that time mm -hmm. so the first 20 years of women's wrestling in japan still in you know kind of sketchy because there was no written history and i'm hoping that the war discover some of the big old poster uh, you know that the, you'll probably find in your grandma's you know back the closet or somewhere you know what i'm saying you yeah. know okay so tell me this when joshi pro wrestling was like you said in the let's we're, we're, we're talking early 70s right now and we're talking about the newspapers and magazines did was it like uh, how things were at the shows where the women's promotions and the men's promotions were separate w did they launch their own joshi pro wrestling publications or were they included in like gong baseball magazine in sections of that how how was the coverage what was the coverage like? uh all japan women's pro wrestling always had their own like a pamphlet and program at their show selling okay Okay, so you they know, had so their there own. There was like a, yeah. a almanac and posters and and the photos, and but that's not really like a largely circulated publication, right? Right, it's for fans. You have to, yeah, you had to buy that, you know, piece of magazine at the show, and if it was 1968, I don't know if you even exist anymore, or like I said, in somebody's garage somewhere, you might be able to discover her, you know, if they didn't throw it away. You need a big, huge superstar. Okay, there was like a group of stars, like you know, like you know, that was on television early, like a Jumbo Miyamoto, and you know, like early Fuji television program. But it wasn't until Mak Fumiake, we call it Maha, Maha Fumiake. Okay, she was born in 1959, and she. It was six feet tall, very pretty, the former karate, Kyokushin karate fighter, who went into the TV show called Star Tanjo. It's like a star search television, much like your today's with America's Got Talent kind of show. Yeah, it wasn't until Maha Fumiake, Mach, like a speed, the, 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 the faster than light, right? Like Mach 10, uh, yeah, Mach 60, yeah. Right, right, right. Maha Fumiake became superstar of Joshi Pro Wrestling in 1974. She was only 
15. That the year before that, that Mah young 13, 14 year old uh, Mah Fumiya Fumiyake went into a TV show called Star Tanjo. Star Tanjo is uh, like a, your star short show, much like today's your America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. You with me on that? Yep, yeah, America's Got Talent. Auditioning show. American Idol, something like that, like a talent. You're looking right, for right, the next right, big right. thing. Talent, star, star search show. Talent search, She yeah. was a finalist. Yeah, she was a finalist. Fumiyake was a finalist of that show and almost got popular during that show too, but the, she did not win that, uh, that the audition star, star is Born show. Instead, after that, right after that, she came to, with her family, she came to All Japan Women and decided to become a professional wrestler instead. That was a huge hit. She was going to be a pop singer and real pretty and tall, like 180 centimeter, like a six feet tall, former Kyokushin karate fighter and age of 15. She made sensational debut in 1974. She was the biggest star for that time period. Mahfumiyake. And she was the one who started singing in the ring because she was going, going to be a singer. So she was multi-talented, had a really unique look, six feet tall for, uh, at 15? Japanese woman. Yeah, in 1974. That's not, you wouldn't see that every day. You don't see that every day now. It's just like, it very, it seems like a unique, unique body, unique personality. And also, Channel 8, Fuji Television decided to have her on different, you know, different shows too. That promoted women's wrestling into really into like a popular that the trend pop culture right there. That the, let's go watch Mahafumiyake, right? She was kind of like spokesperson almost. And later on, yes, yeah, but the, she, at, the, at the age of 15 and 16, yeah, yeah, she was more of like idol, idol mm -hmm. that didn't really have a word then. You know, the, the, she was on television, she was on movies, she was on TV commercial, she appeared on game show, the, the singing shows, and, and later on she even sang. Then they, the channel, it was All Japan Women's idea too, but the Channel 8, Fuji Television wanted to have her in, you know, singing in that ring too. That started the tradition all the way to, you know, Crash Girls, to Aja Kong, to everybody singing in the ring, even Medusa. Yeah, th that tradition remained the ne next 20 years. You know, even but, uh, uh, Maki Ito singing on AEW. I guess, yeah. Right, that's, right. That's, so Japanese women's you know. wrestlers sings in the ring, right? And dance. Yeah. So that, that part still remains as a you know, unique Japanese culture. But uh, actually, Mahakumiyake was a pioneer of that. Mm. That, uh, that the Mahafumiyake era has been somewhat overlooked because of the huge, super big, huge popularity of Beauty Pair. That mm -hmm. came right after. How how close together were the, the those? They were Uyake? actually see, beauty beauty pair, Maki Ueda, Jackie Sato pair, and Mahafumiake. They are all born in 1959, same age actually. Mm -hmm. And what happened was though that Mahafumiake super sensational boom only lasted not even three years, much like Sayama Tiger Mask. Ah, you know, okay. phenomena okay. that uh, she was huge superstar, 74, 75 into 76. And the spring of 1976, she, before telling the company about it, she announced her retirement. And she, she felt that she'd done it all at the age of 17, that she walked away from women's wrestling. That is why she still remains as a, almost like a, elusive or mysterious superstar that existed once upon a time she's still a tv person and she's an actor and she's also an entrepreneur and she does a lot of things now that now that the mahafumiak is what 63 now but she's still a television person but as a wrestling portion of it much like dwayne johnson it will be forgotten you know what i'm saying mm-hmm Mm -hmm. She was Mahafumiyake was a huge superstar and was also a WWE champion in the ring and uh, was a superstar for just three year period, much like Satoru Sayama's Tiger Mask era. They only lasted, you know, a little less than three years. Therefore, that I think that the legend remains even bigger, I guess, because you can only watch her, you know, wrestling in old, old tapes, you know. But 
match. All in all, Maha Fumiyake basically quit and walked out on wrestling in the, in the midst of her biggest peak popularity. And there were two new, you know, younger wrestling, same age, same height, just as athletic, may not be as pretty, but there was a tag team of beauty pair, beauty pair, Jackie Sato and Maki Ueda. And Fuji television people said, we got these girls, and then created beauty pair. Yeah, ta this tag team also was really popular and actually a better worker in the ring than Fumiyake was probably. And also this pair was became much popular among teenage girls and therefore the beauty pair tradition remains. After this beauty pair, you have black pair that, you know, that the the, uh, the queen the golden uh, the queen angels that golden pair the uh, all the way to crash girls or jungle jack or whatever you know or even today's queen's quest or something that the, or the beauty women's pair. beauty they yeah, always had this little unit like faction that the beauty pair was was it uh, had its own like like a, it existed on their own you know hmm. and the team was formed in February of 1976, and their popularity lasted another three years, all the way till 1979. Yeah, and you, we should put that the YouTube video clip, short video clip of that the, the one you discovered that the sure. beauty Fair pair movie. movie trailer. Oh God, they had they were they had their own movies, they had their own concerts. They had their, you know, when, when, when the wrestlers are so popular, you had to come up with gimmick, like a march, T-shirt, the, the, the other things, record, singing. I mean, not the CD or downloading music, but it was a record. You're talking about the vinyl, the single vinyl, you know, you know like a donut record you're talking mm -hmm. about. It was so popular that people bought records and there were movies they had their musical and yeah they did all this a decade before crash girls mm -hmm. we'll get to crash girls lioness asuka and chigusa nagayo era that was equally huge but if there was no if there was no mahafumiyake there was no no beauty pair if there was no beauty pair there wouldn't be a crash girls that's what i'm talking about mm -hmm. that's a star driven on um, business right and that the japanese joshi women's wrestling always had its own league and the own group of fans the own wrestling community and it was never part of men's wrestling see during this you know Mahafumiyake and, and, and Beauty Pair era. Of course, Giant Baba's wrestling existed. Antonio Inoki's, you know, New Japan existed. And it was different. I mean, it was just super popular, but it was almost as if it was different culture. Well, Does that make sense? Look, well, definitely. I mean, if you look at the, you can go on YouTube now and watch some of the old footage and you can see, look into the crowd. It's not your usual all Japan pro wrestling crowd. It's, it's, a All lot of teenage girls. teenage girls. It's like girls probably age 12 to 16. Yeah, with was confetti and headbands and the pom-pom and all these things. And the streaming, you know, like a, that the ribbon streaming is being thrown into the ring. That tradition started in women's wrestling and moved on to men's wrestling. You know, they start so throwing, the you streamers, know, the multi, the, 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 yeah, multi-color streamer. Those yeah, are from the, uh, yeah. yeah, the beauty pair era. Yes. Teenage female fans. Yeah, and like a pop idols. With, exactly. It's it's like a like a pop group, like the same reaction that you know, Spice Monkeys? Girls would have. Monkeys. Oh, yeah. You know, we talked about yeah, earlier. Yeah. Like, Bay City Rollers or something like that. Like oh, one of those similar. acts. One of those Just acts. Just happen that, to be wrestlers. Yeah, they, they happen to be wrestlers, but they also sing and they act in their own movies and they're in commercials mm -hmm. and they're on variety shows at night. There, I think yeah. that it's, it's a, a big, big part of understanding the popularity behind a lot of these. Uh, yeah, and then also wrestlers. Japanese television at night is like a game show heaven, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's <laughs> what I'm so proud of it. But that's when adults are watching television in Japan. And uh, those so shows like Downtown, those are still the most popular shows. Those are what most people like to. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also, we got understanding, you know, mid to seven, you know, late 70s into 80s, there was no such thing as internet. 
therefore no social media of course not even the, not even the internet and not even the VHS you know VCR that you have to watch actual television <laughs> when it's going yeah when it's on you, you got to watch it unless you have a VCR and you can tape yeah, it. But that didn't when come did you have later. your first VCR <laughs> your parents house yeah yeah i'm trying to remember i don't have i didn't uh, buy my yeah my first vcr until memory. like 84 85 probably 80 88 probably when my my yeah. brother was born but i oh, I, really, okay. I don't i don't remember but i think i remember when i got yeah. my first tape rewinder did you have one of those <laughs> tape recorders no no oh, they said tapes they're like oh the open reel no 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 oh not like the open reel it's like uh you basically take the vhs tape and you put it into this little it just looks like a slot and you, you put it into the slot it's a little machine you, you press down on it you press the button and it rewinds the tape for you after you watch the movie because at the ah. rental shop they always you have to you rewind to it all the way to the beginning oh, please be okay. kind rewind <laughs> Okay. So right. I had, uh, See, I, in the 90s, I had era. that. <laughs> the beauty pair era, we didn't even have, or or not just we, but the, the, the world. This world didn't have VCR, you know? Right. But just uh, now that the, on YouTube, somebody had these original tapes or the, the dubbing of the original, now this the, the old footage of beauty pair or even Maha Fumiake start popping up on YouTube, which is good. Which is good, you know, but uh, now we can learn, really learn because all Japan women's popularity in the 90s, enormous, right? But there was such era in mid 70s, there was Maha Fumiake era, and right after that, the beauty pair, Jackie Sato and Maki Weda. But that, the beauty pair era thing only lasted another three years 76, 77, 78, and in the beginning of 1979 at the Budokan. Women, all Japan women ran Budokan shows then still. I mean, like already. And Maki Ueda against Jackie Sato had a single match against each other. The loser has to retire. Mm. Then, therefore, the beauty pair was no longer. And Jackie Sato won the, won the match and won the title. And Maki Ueda really retired for real. And she never came back. Never came back. Now she runs her own bar. Well, 63-year-old Maki Ueda still exists, you know, and people kind of visit. And then she still looks like Maki Ueda. Wow. Aged a little bit, but uh, yeah. And for the record, yeah, Jackie Sato passed away when, when she was, what, 41? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the stomach cancer? Yeah, and then and was living alone, so uh, wasn't really, you know, fond for a while, you know? Mm. But uh, this beauty pair era was so huge, and th therefore you had this, you know, the whole three-year boom period phenomena. And what happened was that when beauty pair basically was broken up, and you know they retired the character, right? What happened was those teenage female fans retired too. I see. Yeah, yeah. It was purely a connection with that generation. Yeah, because what the the base city rollers only lasted you know few year boom period, or your monkeys when TV was on they were popular, but when when the TV show was gone, people found another TV show, right? I I never knew the Bay City Rollers were that popular. I only know the one song. I I think I don't bye know. Bye bye baby. No, I only know Saturday night. Saturday night, <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh, they the were so huge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know the the, to, the little side discussion, but there it's funny that there are some bands that are really huge in Europe and they're really huge in Japan and South America. It was but never in big States, in America that much. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's it could be one of those because it's the same situations. time period that the band Kiss hit in in America. Ah. Uh, you know, guys like like Kiss over Basie Rollers. Basie Rollers was for kids. I mean, for girls. Seven, seventh grade girls. It was like, what oh, was the guy from Partridge Family? What's Leaf uh, Cassidy? Leaf Cassidy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so same thing. But the beauty period remained. But the, what, the, the old Japan women's wrestling 
television was still on, and you had a Queen Angels that uh, Lucy Kayama and Tami Aoyama, then Golden Pair, Nancy Kumi and Victoria Fujimi, that the Black Pair, Yumi Ikeshita and, and Mami Kumano, that the, 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 you know, the semi stars there, and the TV show was there. And then, in, you know, in 1980, you have 16 year old. You know, Jaguar Yokota and Devil Masami, you know, are, you know, arrival, right? And there were, uh, and also Mimi Mimi Hagiwara, that another former pop singer turned wrestler. She was popular too for a short period of time. Mm. And uh, you had to wait till 1984 Crash Girls period. Crash Girls is Chigusa Nagayo and Laune Sasuka. That the, now that Chigusa Nagayo trains, also she there was a 1990s Gaia Japan period where she trained dozens of women's wrestlers, and also that the Gaia Girls documentary film got popular in America too, right? I think like more in England. training. Yeah, it was, it was real because it was brutal BBC, training. Really yeah, intense yeah. scenes with her and Satomura, young Satomura, fifteen-year-old Satomura. Yeah, so um, it's like there's always a link to the next generation of superstars. Isn't that interesting? The, the yeah. link is still there with Rossi. That's yeah, like right. Ones. Yeah, yeah, because he was not a wrestler, so he never retired, and that's his life, you know? And Rossi was there when... Well, actually, 25-year-old Rossi was dr driving Crash Girls' van every day. Hmm. Yeah. Right. I I'd love so to read the, his book, the, the book that he wrote on his phone one day. Oh, yeah, he wrote the entire book on his iPhone. That's amazing. Just a couple years ago, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, now he's a king of stardom, and uh, he uh, he finally reached his peak now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. But, uh, yeah, so uh, we touched upon these things today, but uh, now that the, the, the lesson, I, I think this episode one was that, that uh, Japanese women's wrestling as a whole has actually a lot longer history than, than the people know about. Mm -hmm. There are That's some one. gaps. We're trying to fill in the gaps, I suppose, especially... Oh, God, I haven't even... I mean, this, this, we did our so best. So much to learn. Yeah, there's... there's yeah? A, I mean, I, I think there... The broad strokes are there, for sure. And one difficult thing about Josh Pro Wrestling is that if you do look in more and more with, in, within the history of it, it's much yeah. harder to find good resources on history good i mean because it was never there. covered in print media even right. in japan yeah yeah exactly and, but then we do know that in 90, early 50s 1951 to be exact that there was a milde bark influence on it and in late 1960s 1967 and 1968 to be exact there was fabulous muller muller's influence on it and there was a Lucha Libre influence on it as a style, because a lot of Mexican female wrestlers came over here and stayed length of times and trained with Japanese wrestlers. And all Japan women's wrestlers traditionally were trained on the Lucha the technique that therefore there's a mix of right hand and, you know, working right, working left, you know, working left, turn right, working right, turn left. They, they, they did the both. But the, basically for a long time, Japanese Joshi pro wrestling had this almost like a unique lucha influence on it. That that need to be focused, and there was star power that uh, like out of blue that, that they created or, or the star was born in Mahafumiake, huge huge superstar that uh, who started singing in the ring and it was a big huge pop phenomena and but it was short-lived but she walked away and then then you have right after Mahafumiake, there was beauty pair era jackie sato and maki ueda it became even more popular and therefore it really finalized the style of joshi pro wrestling in japan yeah that's as far as we can get today i guess i don't know yeah but so we had that's the, the first the, when, when yeah when when beauty pair retired all these teenage fans left too, you know? But mm -hmm. the old Japan women were still running 250 to 300 show on the road every day, all through the year, on the bus. And in 1978, 21-year-old Rasi Ogawa joined the company. And also, I think, I mean, when we talk about the fans of the Crush Cows also retiring along with them, 
that also yeah opened and then up. there was a, there was a, there was a short dark age until you had to wait till the rise of Bonacano. yeah and and that kind of the bull dump matsumoto and the beginning of that era of all japan women's wrestling uh, actually I, Bonacano had two peak era because she was uh, you know like a understudy of dump matsumoto era but in in as of 1985-ish Bonacano became solo big time superstar on her own i think what i wanted to get to is that when crush gal's fan base of teenage girls left it opened up all japan's path um, it, it, it kind of it, it's it sort of gave them a right turn to start promoting and marketing to a more men-centric or, or male audience in japan yeah let me squeeze one more element to it Right after Crash Girls, both Chigusa Nagayo and Lioness As- Asuka, re- basically, you know, they, they'll make come back a little bit later on, but uh, they, they had, had their first retirement in 1989, Medusa was brought in to live in Japan by Rashi Ogawa. Alundra Blaze to some. Yeah, to some. And 26 year old Medusa Michelli came from Minnesota and lived in Japan for three years and learned the language, and did all the singing in the ring, and all these promotions, the picture book, and the image videos, and all these things that was done to done pre- previously with, with Beauty Pair and Mahafumi Ake. All the same method was applied to Medusa in 1989. Interesting. There's a, lot, huh? there's a lot of interesting stuff we have to get to just in the 1980s alone. 1980s okay. were an interesting decade. So next time, I guess yeah, we can start yeah. talking more about you know, Beauty, beauty Pair, and uh, NW Beauty Pair in a short period of a little bit of dark age, but the barnstorming style of all Japan progressing, running 300 shows a year, it remained. And there was a Crash Girls era. There was Jaguar Yokota. There was Devo Masami. Then 1989, there was Medusa. So we got to get, we got to start from around there. Yeah. And I think Next all time. of those names that you just mentioned are, are sure. I, I think you can see. They're le- legends, huh? You, you, but you can see and feel the influence of, especially those four, for example. There's, you can still feel their influence today in today's women's wrestling and today's men's wrestling, too. Oh, I mean, Jaguar, Yokota, Devo, Masami, the Crash mm-hmm. Girls, mm-hmm. Lionel Sasuka, and very unique, Chikusa Nagayo, and very even Medusa. And Bonakano, Aja Kang. Yeah. They're very, very... Aja still work in the ring today, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to this day. Yeah. Each is so unique. Each is so different, too. Right, and, and also we'll get to the point where how they reached out to men's audience because Bonacano era they drew men's audience, therefore true wrestling fans, and mm. not as fragile as a peak period. You know that the wrestling fans didn't leave. That uh, we can go probably all the way to 1994 Tokyo Dome show next period, uh, next episode, huh? Oh, the long. I hope so. <laughs> that might need its yeah. own episode. All right, but uh, I think uh, people enjoyed the very this is like a very beginning of like a women's wrestling in Japan one hundred and one lesson. <laughs> yeah, you know? and you know because we covered a lot today, but like we were talking about earlier, there are so many blind spots in the in this, yeah. this in part between, of wrestling history. So if anybody has yeah, questions small audience, small or there. Yes. Or yeah. Comments or anything like that, or or, or love areas. to answer that, and yeah, and, uh, we'll, we'll we'll be putting together pieces of puzzle ourselves. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. It, it's something that's actually it's even in Japanese, it's it's kind of hard to uh, put the pieces together because there's not ma- that many pieces. Because not too many people really watched like last few, 50 years of it without any absence. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's interesting I, to I mean, understand to be honest, why. Yeah, to be honest with you, I didn't watch, you know, I was there, but I didn't really seriously, you know, watch uh, Beauty Pair all that much. Well, was, there were other big... You know, fan and Baba fan. ...going on at the time. It's understandable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And women's wrestling during this, you know, Beauty Pair era, it was on like a Sunday, Sunday afternoon, you know? And that was Sunday afternoon wasn't the time I was watching television, <laughs> you know. But it was, it did kind of develop this different audience, a, a, a unique audience for that product. Yeah, and then All Japan Women's Wrestling were running as, just as many shows as any men's company mm-hmm. all through the year. Yeah. All over, not in all not over Tokyo. Japan. 
Oh no, all over. I think they ran more country shows than men's company. Yeah. And uh, I heard some uh, horror stories of those tours and women ha- with the, uh, <laughs> the IV stuck in them and on the bus, exhausted, dehydrated, broken bones, bruises, all that good stuff. Yeah, and then all, all Japan women's wrestling traditionally was so self-sufficient that the girls built the ring. They put the seat, you know, and they you know, were standing in a concession. They tore down the ring, they packed, and you know, they were back in bus or trucks, and they were here, they went to another town, next town, you know. And therefore, like a 19th century barnstorming, you know, that the elements were all there. Yeah. There's lots to cover, so let's get into lots it next to cover. time. So, yeah, if you have oh, questions, I, I or, sure hope so. Or, or any uh, comments? I'm, I'm or... hoping that the people got real interested in this, you know, the whole history, unique history of women's wrestling in Japan, which is completely separate from men's wrestling culture. Mm, yeah. But it's important to understand because when you understand that, you understand a lot more elements of uh, of wrestling in general. Uh, and and also became a, a something very extent. unique because they didn't have men's wrestling influence. Mm-hmm, exactly. So they you were can never really see that. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah, they now. were never part of men's company. You know, that's what's unique about Japanese women's wrestling. Yeah, yeah. it developed on its own instead of within yeah, the yeah. men's. Well, it developed differently over in the States, but yeah, we'll keep we'll keep talking about it. We'll get into it more next week. So if we have questions or if you have questions or anything like that, Fumi, how can people get a hold of you? On Twitter at Fumihiko Dayo, F-U-M-I-H-I-K-O-D-A-Y-O at Fumihiko Dayo on Twitter or just Fumi Saito on Facebook. Message me first. And I'm at Justin M. Nipper, K-N-I-P-P-E-R on Twitter. Reach out on Twitter, Patreon, email, all that good stuff. Other than that, we're going to get into Silver Age of Joshi Pro Wrestling next week. So until (laughs) next time, Fumi, take it away. So long from Tokyo. You can be a part of bringing the dreams of families to life when you consider egg donation with Fairfax Egg Bank. It's easier than you think. Fill out an application online, meet for screening appointments, and begin. Because your efforts are so important, you'll be compensated up to $60,000. So if you're a female between the ages of 19 and 30 and are a healthy non-smoker, contact Fairfax Egg Bank today. FairfaxEggBank.com. You could be compensated up to $60,000 for your time and effort in helping a family grow. Fairfax Eggbank.com. Experts agree Prop 33 will make the housing crisis worse, reducing new affordable housing and empowering wealthy opponents to block new homes. Plus, 33 repeals laws protecting low-income tenants from huge rent increases. California needs more housing, not less. No on Prop 33. Ad paid for by No on 33, Californians for Responsible Housing. A bipartisan coalition of affordable housing advocates, taxpayers, veterans, and small businesses. Sponsored by the California Apartment Association. Ad Committee's top funder, California Apartment Association.